that's an incredible story. Certainly related to the part of using alcohol to shrink the brain. <laughs> it does work. <laughs> Always with some humor. <laughs> uh, how we doing? Good. We're going to be talking a little bit today about a topic that I absolutely enjoy. We're going to be talking a little bit today about spiritual gifts. And just as kind of a foundation under this, uh, one of the things I was thinking along these lines is there's a couple of questions that are as old as man himself. Questions like, who am I? And why am I here? And as an extension of that, when man first realized that there was a God after the fall and after they forgot about him, when man started to rediscover his spiritual roots, the obvious question to ask in regards to God is, who are you? And why are you here? And what do you want? What do you want with me? And I think those are some very good questions that demanded answers centuries ago, and they still demand answers today. And that's why I love this series that we're in right now about the will of God. I can't think of a better topic to land on occasionally than to talk a little bit and try to get our questions answered in regards to what exactly is God's will. What does he want? What does he want with me? And that's why, again, you know, to be able to talk a little bit about this, I think that it's a, it's a beautiful topic. And what it really leads into then is an understanding of our conception of God. I think you've heard me say before that if there was only one topic that I could teach on, without a doubt, what I would try to convey to people for the rest of my life is to try and help people to understand, to gain an honest, accurate conception of God. Everything spiritually goes back to that one foundation, what we believe God is like. What is his nature? What is his character? Depending on what we believe to be true about that, that is not only going to determine the course of our spiritual life, but it's actually going to determine the course of our life in general. For example, if you really believe that deep down God is an angry God, then what does God want? Well, obviously, he wants to punish us. If we truly believe that God is, uh, is a slave owner or an employer or a taskmaster, then obviously what God wants is to put me to work. He demands that I do things for him. If I deep down believe that God is selfish or needy, then my perception of him is that he actually is, wants me to give him stuff, give him money, give him my possessions. If I believe that God is lonely, then I'm going to believe that he demands my time and my attention. Or on the opposite extreme, if I really believe that God is cold and impersonal, if God is distant, then I might come to believe that God wants absolutely nothing at all from me. He wants nothing to do with me. And so, again, based on what we believe to be true about God, that is going to determine our relationship with him, how we view him and how we connect to him and how we respond to him. So in our passage today, what we're dealing with specifically is we're looking at the book of Romans, the 12th chapter, the 4th through the 8th verse, which says, just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. 
If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. What do you think of when you hear the word gifts? To some of us, the word gift might make us start thinking about some occasions where it's appropriate to give and receive gifts. We might think of a holiday like uh, Christmas or uh, Valentine's Day. We might think of a special occasion like a birthday. Uh, others, when we think of gifts, we might think of certain things that we have received as gifts and how great those things were. Or on the other hand, when we think of gifts, we might think of that time when we actually thought of a perfect gift and we're, we were able to give somebody something that really had true value and meaning to them. We might think of how happy they were when they received it. And that leads us to look at both the receiving and the giving of gifts. What does the Bible mean when it talks about spiritual gifts? What, how does God view gifts? And one of the truths in here is that, uh, unfortunately, all too often in religion, when people think about God and gifts, what their, where their head goes then is they think of a God that demands gifts. They think of what God wants them to give God. Instead of realizing that primarily, when the Bible talks about gifts, it's not talking about things we give to God or give up to God. It's exactly the opposite. The Bible primarily talks about things that God wants to give to us. Now, some of those gifts are personal. Some of those gifts are for our own benefit. The Bible lists a lot of things that God wants to give us, things like primarily salvation. God wants to give each and every one of us eternal life. Beyond that, the Bible talks about God giving us mercy. It talks about God offering us forgiveness, giving us peace, joy, God offering us understanding, his protection, his provision. And all of those things are great gifts from God that he wants to give us, things that we want to receive. And But there's a whole nother level of gifting that the Bible talks about when it comes to spiritual gifts. And those are gifts that God gives us, not just to keep, but it empowers us and equips us and enables us to have things to offer to other people, things that we can give away. Now, one of the truths about gifts is I don't think that God is in the business of repossessing gifts. I think if God gives you something, it's yours to keep. I don't think that God is in the business of saying, well, since you didn't use something, I'm going to take it back. But I do believe that God's giving of gifts is conditional. And one of the primary requirements in order to receive a gift from God is that we have to receive it. Like Terry's our resident postman here. You ever get a package that says return to sender? <laughs> yeah. So... You know, somebody refused to, to receive it. Now, did you ever want to tear one of them open and see what was inside of it? <laughs> see why they didn't want it? See, that? Uh, I mean, I'm overwhelmingly curious. I, You know, I, that's what I'd do. That's why I can't work at the post office. Well, but, but, you know, I would want to know what's in here. Why did they reject them? And you see, it's equally curious to me today why people would reject the gifts of God. They're free, and they're great things. Why would anybody say no? But unfortunately, the nature of what God wants to give us is we often think either that we only can receive things if we work to earn them, or we reject them for reasons because we're basically deceived. 
And when God offers us things like his mercy or his salvation, we go, no, that's okay. Return to sender. So it is curious sometimes how we as people react to gifts. But I think humanly, I think we do have some great points of reference when it comes to gifting, especially when it comes to understanding God giving us spiritual gifts so that we have things to offer other people. I love the picture of this. There's an object lesson that paints a picture of God giving each one of us certain spiritual gifts. And I think it, it'll particularly, hopefully, make sense to anybody that ever had small children. Whenever there's a special occasion like Christmas or a birthday and you have really a really young son or a daughter, you'll t what will you do? They want to give a gift to mom or dad or maybe even back to you. So what you do is you take them shopping. Now, unfortunately, they don't have any money because they won't get a job. <laughs> so you kind of falls on you to pay for it. But you'll take them and drive them to the store. You'll take them shopping and try to steer them towards the gift that you want them to pick out and give to mom or dad or whoever. You get up to the counter, and, of course, you have to pay for it. Then you take them home, and it also falls on you to help them wrap it and not break it before they give it away, and then keep it wrapped so they don't open it up for mom or dad or whoever. And then when it comes time for them to give the gift, you just stand back and watch the show, don't you? And you get to participate in the joy of watching your child get all excited giving this gift away. And you get to share in the joy of whoever is receiving that gift. And it's not important for you to go, hey, you know, I, I actually picked that out and paid for it. <laughs> you don't care about the credit, do you? All you care about is the moment and how great it is to be able to teach a lesson to somebody you love, a lesson about giving, and to be able to share in the joy of somebody else giving and receiving. And if that makes sense to you, then you have an insight into the mind of God. You know how God feels when he gives us spiritual gifts that we are able to give and share with other people. And you see, this is why a study in spiritual gifts is so awesome to each and every one of us because it helps us to get our head around not only what God thinks, but how God feels. Unfortunately, all too often, when we form a conception of God, the most critical piece is the one that we leave out, the emotion, the feeling. We tend to form this conception of God that's 10 feet tall and bulletproof and has no heart, has no emotion, has no feeling. That's why I think the most, one of the most significant lines in the entire New Testament is also one of the shortest. Christ wept. Do you know how huge that is? To picture a God that actually has a capacity to cry, to feel something at such a deep level. And my understanding of that passage is the word cry, there's several words in the Greek that can be translated cry. And this wasn't the British one tear running down his cheek kind of cry, stiff upper lip. This was bald, like a baby, heaving, emotional, crying. And you see, the reason I think that is so significant because is because that pendulum swings both ways. And if God Almighty has the ability to cry, then he must also have the ability to laugh. One of my all-time favorite pictures of Christ, and you know, people have these depictions of Jesus, and it's always curious, isn't it, that any time you encounter a picture that is supposed to depict Christ, you always know who that is. They never look the same, but you always just know that that's a depiction of what somebody thought Christ looked like. And there's, you know, it's always interesting. You go into different churches, and some of them have surfer Jesus or, you know, biker Jesus or hippie Jesus. And, you know, they have these different ones. 
It's also always struck me curious, you know, because the first two spiritual gifts that I discovered I had, one of them was the gift of cynicism. <laughs> the other was the gift of criticism. <laughs> I used to go into churches and I'd amuse myself by thinking, you know, it is kind of wild that if somebody that looked like that actually showed up in here, <laughs> you know, people would think he was out of place. Uh, they wouldn't know what to do with him. But, but I digress. The point of that is there's all these different depictions of Christ. I've got one hanging at home on my wall that I love more than any of them, and it shows laughing Jesus. It's Christ, our Lord, with his head cocked back, with his huge grin on his face, and he's laughing out loud. And I, the first time I saw that, I just thought, that is the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. Because it, it stops you cold. That's what art does, right? It, it just it makes you feel. It makes you think. It elicits a response. And that, to me, was art. Because it, I stopped and went, well, I know that's Jesus, but he's laughing. It's not how we picture God Almighty, somebody that has a capacity to laugh or cry. So, again, you know, I, I think that the beauty of this is when you start to get our, when we start to get our heads around how God really is, it unlocks a lot of things. And that's where this study of spiritual gifts comes in. Because one of the, tr here's a true statement that I really stand on that says, you can discover your purpose by studying your design. Now, that's true about pretty much anything. For instance, uh, how about a car example? Okay, Mark. <laughs> that seems to work. You could go out here into the parking lot, and you could easily discern the purpose of any vehicle in this parking lot just by studying its design, couldn't you? If you look at the particular features that are incorporated into any one of these vehicles, you would instantly know what the purpose of that vehicle is. For instance, if you go out there and you've got this huge monster truck and it's this high off the ground and it's got these huge aggressive tires on it and a heavy-duty off-road suspension and this huge big block V8 motor, would you think, well, there's a great vehicle for daily transportation. <laughs> That's what I need just to go from point A to point B. Oh, see, what's that designed for? It's designed to drive off road. It's designed to plow through the mud. That thing's designed to tow things. It, and that's, how do you know that? It's because of its design. Now, conversely, if you go out there and you have this little car that's very, it's lightweight and aerodynamic, and it has these skinny little uh, radial tires with very low rolling resistance and a fuel-efficient four-cylinder motor. Now, is that what you want to buy if you want to pull a trailer? <laughs> is that what you want to pull your camper with through the mountains? Of course not. See, by design, you would instantly know that vehicle was made for very efficient transportation, just to get a person from point A to point B, not for hauling materials, just for hauling it. Or conversely, if you went out and saw another very sleek aerodynamic car, but it's got, you know, the big motor in it, high performance, uh, maybe like a 383 small block Chevy, you know, kicking about 420 horse, let's say, or, <laughs> you know, five speed, oh, oh. and you know, it's got the big sticky tires on it, maybe a convertible top or a key roof. What's that for? That's not, that's to take you from point A to point B. Fun. <laughs> in a fun way, in a fast way. And you see, that is a sports car. So if we can figure out all this stuff about a car in the parking lot, wouldn't the same principles apply to figuring out ourselves? If we really want to answer the question, who am I and why am I here? What is my purpose? I believe one of the best ways of understanding your purpose is to understand your design. What exactly did God Almighty build into me? What particular 
qualities or traits did he put into my personal design? What was on God's blueprint before I rolled off that assembly line? And you see, this is where, when years ago when Hope Church got started, and I ended up in these classes where we were starting to explore spiritual gifts, this absolutely blew my mind because I'm learning this stuff and I'm starting to gain some really great insights into myself and about why I'm here and, and what I have to offer. And I mean, I got excited about this stuff because what I came to understand in this design thing is this really isn't rocket science. What do teachers do? Teach? <laughs> Durr. You know, teachers teach, preachers preach, givers give, helpers help. Leaders lead, shepherds shepherd, administrators administrate. And you see, that's what we do. Because that's what we're given to give. And it becomes very apparent then what our purpose is. And that's why I love that passage that we read out of Romans today. Because, you see, if we're operating according to our giftedness, it doesn't say in here, you know, if somebody has one of these gifts, get him to use it, does it? It doesn't say coerce this guy into action or, or make him do this, you know, make the teachers teach or, or somehow manipulate or motivate people into doing this. I love the word they use, let him. Let them do that. Anybody have a dog? You know, and you got to let him out? You know, when you have to let your dog out, do you have to, like, physically throw him out or, or shove him out the door when you let your dog out? No. He wants to go, doesn't he? <laughs> Unless it's winter in South Dakota, you might, you might have to drag him a little bit. But, but primarily, when you let your dog out, it implies it's his idea. <laughs> Sometimes, if it's a big dog, you can't keep them in. You open that door a crack, they're gone. And that's the same exact picture of letting people use their spiritual gifts in a community environment like in a church. See, it implies we are equipped to do this and we want to do it. There's times when you can't not get people to do that. Uh, one of the things I learned is one of my main gifts is I'm a teacher. And I always pictured teaching as being kind of like being a cook or a chef. See, what chefs do is they go into a kitchen, you have all these raw ingredients, and all they do is take these different ingredients, they have meats and spices and different ways of cooking them up. You got ovens and grills and broilers. and they just mix, they take all this stuff and they process it and they mix it together. And when it comes out of the kitchen, it's not only edible, but it's good. You want to eat it, don't you? And that's the talent of a chef. Now, if you think about it, you know, technically, you should be able to go into that kitchen and make your own stuff just by eating the raw ingredients, right? <laughs> I mean, if I'm reading a box of Duncan Hines cake mix, it says, well, use a cup of sugar. So I just eat a cup of sugar. And then it says, oh, a cup of milk. So I'm going to wash that down with a cup of milk. Then it says, use this package of cake mix. So I'm going to eat that. Now, technically, I'm having some cake. <laughs> but it don't taste like cake. Why? Because nobody mixed it together. And you see, that's to me, what teachers do. They take all this information and they process it and package it and feed it back to people in a way that they get it. They want to ingest it and it makes sense when it's explained. And because that's my one of my gifts that I believe I have, sometimes, and my wife will testify to this, there are times, believe it or not, when you cannot shut me up. <laughs> Because if I see somebody that needs some learning, <laughs> I'm there to learn them. <laughs> and 
I just, here we go. And there's times when I think I see opportunities that apparently really didn't exist, and I'm splaining stuff to people that they didn't need splaining. And I'm laying stuff out. You know, it's the old joke of you ask me what time it is, and I'll explain how to build a, a watch. <laughs> and it, it's, but it's just, man, I just, that's my deal. I just like helping people to understand stuff. And at, you don't, you got to hold me back. You tell me to knock it off sometimes. You know, it's like a running joke when we first got married. You know, I'm telling the wife, I'm explaining how to, the best way of doing laundry and the best way of doing certain things that she apparently didn't want to learn. And <laughs> <laughs> So now it's a running joke in our house when she's doing something. I just say, you, know, you want me to tell you how to do that right? <laughs> but it's a joke, you know, and she gets it. She's got a great sense of humor. She wouldn't have married me. She's also an animal lover. <laughs> Explains why she's attracted to me. <laughs> but, but that's the beauty of of letting us do this, you know, because it, it does. It should feel right. You should be in that zone, and it should come natural. But, and along with that, learning my design helped me to understand what God wanted me to do. But you know what was an even bigger fruit of studying spiritual gifts? And this, to me, is, is so profound. In understanding this, it also helped me to understand what I am not expected to do. Because there are certain gifts that I ain't got. Now, that's not bad English. That's the truth. There's some things. I ain't got them because I just ain't got them. <laughs> like, for instance, uh, one of the gifts I do not have is a gift for evangelism. I mean, even as a little kid, you know, you'd see these ads on TV, people traveling to foreign countries and setting up ministries and missionary work, you know, flatline, none of that. Another thing I just ain't got is I do not have a gift of mercy. That doesn't mean I can't be merciful, but when it comes to sick and injured people and, and you know, people with certain disabilities, I just, I can't, I just, I don't have that particular gift. And believe me, there's times when that scared me because I thought I ought to. And there's times I thought, what am I, some kind of a sociopath? You know, I, I should be able to have responses to certain things or be able to help in certain ways. And I just, it ain't there. It is just not there. It's not in me. And I just... You know, but I, I guess another class of people that don't have that are doctors. You know, if can you imagine a doctor fainting at the sight of, sight of blood? If he had an emotional reaction to cutting someone open or setting a broken limb? So, you know, with the gifts that I've been given and the things I'm called to do, I think sometimes it can be a blessing that I don't have certain merciful traits, because there's times I have to tell people things they don't want to hear. And so I think that there's ways that this all works together, and that's my point, because I was raised in a place where it was not okay to say no. They practiced what we call the, uh, the warm body form of calling people into ministries, where, okay, if you have a pulse... <laughs> You are qualified to fulfill this position over here, and that's all it takes. So what they would do is they would mix things up where they had people that were extremely gifted in this area, but oh, we, but the opening's here, so anybody should be able to do any job. And because of that, it was never okay to say no, and even if I wanted to say, I I, I have no passion for that, I have no interest in that, I have no talent in that, but if you, somebody said, well, you need to do this, be like, okay. And what we tried to create here at Hope Community Church is the freedom to be able to say, I choose not to do that because that is not my gift. What a freeing thing that is. I'm sorry, but that is not something that I am gifted at. And it's that simple. 
if we're not gifted, then we're not called into it. And, oh, you know how freeing that was to be able to say, you know what? If you're looking for somebody to go to Zimbabwe, that's not my gift. That's not my deal. And to not have to feel guilty or ashamed at turning down that wonderful opportunity because it's just not my thing. And, and that's, that's one of the things I really loved about this. And, you know, when we wrote a study in spiritual gifts, there's a couple of quick things I'd like to read because I think these things really came out straight. The introduction to this gift study we did years ago, it said, why study spiritual gifts? It says, spiritual teaching often does not teach us anything. Rather, it strengthens and confirms those things which God has already revealed to us through his indwelling spirit. In that sense, a study such as this one can free you, validate you, give you permission to believe that what the spirit within said to you is really true. By rightly acknowledging our spiritual gifts, we are free to exercise them. Perhaps even more freeing is the knowledge we gain of those gifts we do not possess. Therein lies the ability to say no without guilt or shame. It is through the gifts we've been given that we are able to help others. It is through the gifts we lack that we're able to need others. Only Jesus Christ possessed every spiritual gift and in full measure. God never intended any of us to know it all or to do it all. If we could be so independent, we could never become interdependent, and the whole church would break down. You see, that's good stuff. I like that. And that leads us into the next point, where by understanding both what we have and what we don't, it helps us not to glue each other together like this, but rather to bond each other like this. Uh, in the world, they talk a lot these days about diversity, don't they? But unfortunately, in this world, diversity often produces division. In the Bible, diversity actually produces harmony. It produces a way of fitting things together. And that's where another thing that came out of this original gift study, it said, God has allowed each and every one of us to also have a personal style. This is what determines how we serve. We are all aware that other people have different approaches. Unfortunately, when left to our own devices, we tend to think, why can't they all be more like me? We mistakenly draw the conclusion that things would run better if only everyone did things our way. Have we ever stopped to consider the value of other approaches? Just as carpenters will tell you the strongest joints are made of tongues and grooves, the same principle applies to our common bond in the church. Imagine putting a puzzle together if all the pieces were perfectly square. Imagine music if every instrument sounded the same and played the same note, the same part. Similarly, it is our combination of strengths and weaknesses that hold us together and allows the whole body to flow and function in wholeness. You see, that makes sense, doesn't it? You know? And, and you know, what that leads to then is that, you know, to understand diversity is not about division, but rather about having the ability to fit together in harmony, that starts to make some pretty good sense. There's some things in life that are complementary. They're not identical, but they complement each other. Uh, like certain foods. Chocolate and peanut butter go together like chocolate and peanut butter, don't they? <laughs> They're not the same, but boy, they sure go good together. Uh, there's other things that are contrasting. They're, not only are they different, they're actually opposite, but they go together wonderfully. Things that are contrasting are things like sweet and sour. Oh, dinner time, I'm getting hungry here. Uh, good cop, bad cop, kind of go together. Uh, black and white are opposite colors, but yet they blend together very well. 
But then you get into a third class of things that aren't only different and complementary, but they're different and conflicting, aren't they? Like the example we used a few weeks ago, milk and pickles. You know, some things go together like milk and pickles. That's not two foods you want to mix, trust me. Uh, my wife tells me that plaids and stripes don't go together. That was some new information. <laughs> I thought that went together about as well as my paisley shirts and white painter pants, but those are now off limits too. <laughs> I thought those complemented each other quite well, but that's another no-no. You learn stuff when you get married. Uh, so, so there's some things that, that don't go together. And that leads us into this other part that came out of this gift study we did. It says, a group of Christians encounter a destitute man. One of them with a the gift of teaching you know, looks at this guy and discerns both the problem and the solution. So if you have a gift of teaching, you look at this destitute guy, and here's where his head goes. He has a gift of teaching, so what he thinks is, well, obviously this guy needs to learn some things because he lacks knowledge. I can explain to him what he needs to do. Another with the gift of intercession thinks, well, obviously this guy needs prayer. He needs spiritual support. One with the gift of shepherding looks at this guy, and he thinks, well, this guy needs somebody just to take him under his wing. So come on, dude, you got to join up. Uh, still another person who's gifted in mercy thinks, well, obviously this guy needs somebody to bathe him and feed him and give him clean clothes and give him a place to live. So the merciful would basically move him in. Uh, yet another with the gift of giving thinks, well, this guy needs some help getting back on his feet. So, you know, here's some money. Uh, still another with a gift of administration might look at this guy and thinks, well, obviously he doesn't know where the resources are. So he's not going to help him so much personally, but what he offers is he'll tell the guy, well, hey, here's a list of homeless shelters, and here's a list of food banks and soup kitchens, and here's a list of places where you can go about getting a job, and here's where you can get some transportation. That's administration. Still another with a gift of encouragement might look at this guy and thinks, this dude needs a pep talk. <laughs> so I just need to, to encourage him to, to hang in there and keep moving forward. So, so it says, amazingly, each one of these people is correct. Because God has given us different gifts, our acts of service will take many different forms. In fact, this example illustrates that our particular gifting can even influence our identification of people's problems. This does not make one person right and another person wrong. It just makes us different. There is room for diversity in the body of Christ. Who is to say which particular act will be the one to influence another to investigate Christ or to fully accept him? The Bible says that one man will sow and another man reap. In other words, even our goals are different. Sometimes we plant the seed and other times we bring in the crop. So, you know, this too was some really valuable information for me because I started to understand why I approach certain things in certain ways. It's been said that if the only tool you have is a hammer, you tend to see every problem as a nail. <laughs> Based on what gifts I have, what I have to offer, I tend to see things through that narrow lens. I tend to see other people's needs through that narrow lens of what I have to offer. But it starts to make sense when we see how different people with different gifts, talents, and abilities can all contribute to the greater good. And you see, to kind of move towards wrapping this up then, what God is, I believe, he is like a, an efficiency expert. I don't know if they still employ these people in corporations, but I remember years ago when a company would break down and the communication didn't work and everybody, you know, it was like an orchestra where you didn't have a conductor. 
Everybody's just going their own direction, doing their own thing. And they would bring in an efficiency expert. And what they did was they would test and evaluate employees and simply look for what their strengths and weaknesses were. And then they would give them job descriptions based on what they were good at. It sounds like the, the simplest thing in the world, but I work at a corporation. Believe me, this is not obvious <laughs> to managers anymore because, like, in my own case, I spent 10 years running a printing press. So what did they do? Well, they moved me into supervision. Now I'm not running machines, I'm running people. That's a whole different thing. And apparently I did okay at that, so then they moved me from supervision into management. Now I'm not even managing people so much as systems. So, you know, every time you get promoted, you move a little farther away from your original specialty. There was a guy who wrote a book called The Peter Principle, and he said in a hierarchy, people tend to get promoted to their level of incompetence. <laughs> you know, they move you through the ranks until you hit a wall where you're doing something that's so out of your ability that you just can't function. Well, they don't demote you or put you back at something you were good at. They just park you there and leave you. Nowadays, they'll put you there and get rid of you. But... Uh, but that was this guy's premise. He wrote this book around that. I've seen this and that. So then they'd bring in efficiency expert to shuffle the deck and put people back at what they were good at. Do you know how harmonious a church can run when every person is simply doing what they are called to do and gifted to do? It sinks. But I, like I say, I came out of a church that had everybody doing things that they weren't good at, weren't gifted at, weren't called to do, and the whole thing just lumbered along and everybody was miserable. Do you know who, an, who is the textbook example of an inefficiency expert? The devil. Who wants the church to break down? Who wants us to be singing different off a different playbook? You know, who wants us to not be efficient and effective? See, I believe that the church has an adversary. We have an adversary that wants us to not be able to do what God has called us to do. And he operates primarily, or I would actually be so bold as to say exclusively through deception. The devil's one superpower, he's a really good liar. <laughs> and what more do you need? His ability to con convince people to get in their heads and tell them things that are not true is how he accomplishes his purpose. And what better way to keep us from helping other people than to talk us into believing that we should be able to do things we can't do. To talk us into believing we ought to be able to do certain things. See, I was actually leading this gift study we were doing years ago as part of a small group. And I'm talking like I did earlier about how the one gift I don't have is for evangelism and foreign countries. And there was a gal in the front row that had this starry-eyed look and you know and she just said, Oh, I'd love that. You know, I mean that just right there blew me away. I mean, how could that just doesn't compute. So out of curiosity, you know, I said to her, Well, because I was explaining how for years, in my head, what I believed to be true, because it was piped in, the voice in my head said, if you were really a Christian, you'd be on the next plane to Zimbabwe. That's what real Christians do. And if you were ever get serious about God, that's where you'd go. And that's what you'd be called into. And that kept me from getting serious for a number of years. I thought, man, I just, I don't want to do that. I can't do that. And so I asked this, this lady, I said, so out of curiosity, what does your head tell you that you would be doing if you were really a good Christian? She says, well, for years my head said if I was doing it right, I'd be doing what you're doing right now. <laughs> yeah, my head says if I'm doing it right, I'd be standing up in front of people, you know, teaching classes. And she said, I got nothing for public speaking. That terrifies. And you see, that doesn't mean that she couldn't do that because in some cases it's our gifts call us into things and it's our lying mind that instills the fear. 
So just because she'd be afraid to do it doesn't mean she's not called to do it. Could be just the opposite. Like Wiley e. Coyote in the in the uh, Roadrunner cartoon, setting up them roadblocks, you know, to try and stop that roadrunner. And the roadrunner just keeps running right through them. See, sometimes we have those seeming obstacles we need to plow through. But other times our lying mind will just try to convince us that we should be able to do things that we're really not called into doing. And that's where From the devil's point of view, if you want to separate people from God, you have to start by separating people from each other. And you see, you cannot live a spiritual life alone because this is a community thing. We're called to form a body as we all come together. And the lies in our heads say either we can't help others because we're ineffective or we can't help others because they're, ir they're not and the truth is that God is going to accomplish things through us. All we have to do is let him do what he's going to do too. So the final piece of this then is there were four things that we studied back in the day. We studied that our spiritual gifts tell us where to serve. Based on my gifts, that tells me where I'm going to land, what I'm going to do. Our personal style tells us how we serve. We're all wired to do sometimes the same thing in different ways. Not every teacher is going to teach the same. Not every leader is going to lead the same. And that's okay. That's part of the diversity. Our passion is going to determine who we serve. Some people are very passionate about children. Some people are passionate about the law. Some people have other causes. But that, too, is God laying things on our heart. And finally, love provides the why of it. Why do we serve? And hopefully there's one good reason why we do everything we do. Love. God only has one motive, I believe. Love. Everything God does, everything God doesn't do, always is motivated by love. And I think the closer we get to him, the more that that manifests itself too. Just, uh, we'll call the worship team up. But, or is Mike going to... Yeah, we'll do the worship team thing first. So I want to do the closing song, and Mike's going to have, I think, the last final few words. Uh, if anybody's interested more, hopefully we're going to pull together some spiritual gift studies in the future. But just as a little taste of it, I took the liberty of publishing a list of spiritual gifts, and they're kind of broke down here in a way you can digest them. <laughs> gifts that provide direction, connection, protection, and production. Mike's going to love that. A lot of alliteration. <laughs> and if you're interested in that, I've got a bunch of copies of that up here. If you want to see a little more about that, come up and grab one after the service. Thanks. Father, thank you for um, your many designs in creating this world and creating your church, which is the people. Thank you for the people you have brought to us. Um, thank you for the support we gain from one another, from just being together, gathering on a Sunday morning, and hopefully staying for lunch. Um, your provisions are many. Your plan is perfect, and we're grateful. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>